Hi everyone and welcome to the NG Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Einson. This week, we're putting the podcast together in conjunction with Pint, the leading charity in the UK for people who use artificial nutrition. And this is to mark the start of their campaign called Let's Talk About Han, Home Artificial Nutrition. We are joined by two Pint ambassadors, Gary and Colette Taylor, who will talk about Gary's journey to using enteral nutrition and the impact that that has had on them and their family. We really hope that there's some useful insights for healthcare professionals in this and also some help and advice for other people who use artificial nutrition. Colette, Gary, welcome to the NG podcast. Thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us. Um, This is the first time we've had someone who has to use enteral nutrition or a family member of someone who uses enteral nutrition uh, speaking to us. So so you're both breaking new ground. Um, I, I know firsts are a bit of a habit uh, for you both, um, and I do want to come to those later uh, in the discussion. But um, as this episode is going out to coincide with Pints, let's talk about HAN, Home Artificial Nutrition Campaign. I, I wanted to focus on both of your journeys through to using enteral nutrition and it becoming part of your lives. Gary, um, can I ask you to tell us about what happened to you up to the point when you had your operation that ended up with you needing long-term enteral nutrition? Hi, Marcus. Uh, Thanks for having us anyway. You are Uh, welcome. So going back to 2016, uh, obviously, I was a keen sportsman and I got a football injury to my groin. So I went to doctors and they, uh, they told me, obviously, this lump I had in my groin needed checking out. So, but he also then found the lump in my neck. And he says, that definitely needs checking out. It's not your tonsils. Yeah. And I says, well, going back a further, like 15 years, I've always been told that that lump in my neck will be tonsils. And I should, you know, get them taken out. But <laughs> as a bloke and as a you know, person that's terrified of hospitals, I turned around and said, no, I'm fine. I won't have it done. Mm. You know, and decided not to bother. So obviously this time, when the doctor said, it's not your tonsils, I thought I'd better go and get it checked out. So off I went to hospital, thinking, I'm all right, they're only going to do a scan and have a look. So they had the scan done. I had to then obviously wait to find out what the results were. But after that, I had to go to Huddersfield Hospital. I met the consultant that said he was going to take his uh, lump out, which turned out to be a tumour. But they didn't know if the tumour were cancer or benign. So I had to then wait more time. And in between that waiting, all I could think about, well, is it cancer? Have I got Mm. cancer? You know, what's going to happen to his lives? Mm. You know, the unknown is the worst thing. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, it was going to be benign, but I didn't know. Went back to Huddersfield. He turned around and said, we don't know what it is, but it's too big for us to operate on. You're going to have to go to Bedford. I went, Bedford? I went, okay. But, you know, what's going to happen? And they said, well, they'll explain what they're going to do because they're more equipped to get this tumour out. So on his first visit over to Bedford, the surgeons turned around and said, we still don't know what it is. You're going to have to have a core biopsy. So back to this field to have that done. So yeah, again, it's the unknown. <clears throat> the waiting. The, you know, do we tell the kids anything yet? Or do we just wait? So we decided to wait. Had the core biopsy, which isn't pleasant. That hurt. No. no. And I'm sure Claire might mention how it looked because I had my eyes closed when it were happening. Hmm. 
And then weeks passed, went back to Bradford. He turned around and said, you have a tumour, but it's benign. Mm -hmm. So the weight off my shoulders just went. Yeah. I thought, great. And, you know, you just sigh of relief. Then they came around and said, right, we need to get it out. How are we going to do that? He said, no. What we're going to have to do is take one of your front teeth out, cut from the middle of the bottom of your lip, right here, mm -hmm. all the way down to Adam's apple, all the way around, up to me here, and break my jaw. And then obviously open me up to get to it. Well, I've said this in past, I said, all I could think about at that point was the film Predator, mm. where Arnold Schwarzenegger meets the alien's yeah, yeah. face. And obviously it opens up. And at, at that point, I kind of went blank. And luckily, obviously, Colette were there to take any notes, ask questions, because I kind of just went quiet and were thinking, what's going to happen? So obviously, <clears throat> going home, all we could think about was, how we're going to tell the kids, mm -hmm. you know, how am I going to work? How are we going to finance? You know, can I work afterwards? And they were saying, you know, I've been in intensive care for weeks and I'm off in drip. And yeah. it's, it's just little bullet points like that that just kept coming back for weeks and weeks, which to them were probably just days. But for me and Colette, it were like months and months. Yeah. And then obviously, the time came, I had a pre-op, which were fine, no problems, they went through things. And I thought, right, a week to go. Obviously, nerves were kicking in, mm. worried. He turned round to us and said, we can't operate. It's touching base his skull. And, you know, the only place you can have that is in Leeds because they've got brain surgeons that can be on standby if you need anything. Yeah. So then, more worry. Mm. More waiting. And obviously, I didn't want to go in. I was petrified at this point, thinking, what's going to happen to me? You know, they were talking about having trekkies in, having, maybe having a stroke. You know, it's like, well, am I going to get through all this? You know, everything was just big confusion. And I went to Leeds for another appointment, another hospital, to be told there is some good news. You may not need to be cut, jaw broken, until we get you down into surgery, which I thought was a slight added bonus to it all. Yeah, yeah. It's not much of a bonus, though, is it? It's not, but it's better than uh, what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. And, but the worst part was that the may, you know, be hit with a stroke. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, talked to Colette and decided at that point to get married before operation. We spoke to the surgeon, he said, for what it is, for an extra week, nothing's going to change. So go get married and come back. So doing that would kind of making sure Colette could, you know, have full control and make decisions if I came out of it worse for yeah. wear. But obviously, as you can see, I'm still here. I'm yeah, still yeah. Fighting. Yeah. Honestly, Gary, the things us men have to do to get women to marry us. <laughs> I would try not to. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I haven't spoken to Colette much, but I get the impression if she wants something, she's going to have it. So. <laughs> Thanks for that, Gary. I mean, I have to say, because having read your story, you tend to edit the, the words down in, in a written page a bit. I hadn't realised that there'd been that many gaps. That that must have been must have been really tough, that, you know, trying to sit on it, trying to keep it from the kids and stuff. So thank you for thank you for going through that. If I can bring Colette in now, one of the things when I read your story and Gary separately is there's a little bit of a difference in the way uh, each of you talk about the journey. Uh, Gary's is much more focused on what happened uh, after the operation, 
whereas actually there's a big chunk of yours which is about that build up um can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you and the kids while you were waiting for the diagnosis and treatment and how that felt for you well as gary said there was so much uncertainty what do you tell the children if you don't know yourself and the doctors didn't know all the time we were constantly being told we don't know what it is we don't know what it is we don't know what it is we don't know we're going to deal with it so we didn't really have any information that was cast iron that we could actually tell the children to start with yeah so it was the more and more appointments we went to the more confused we got yeah. it were like you know we just do not know what's coming so obviously we we didn't tell the children until near enough the last minute really yeah. and i'll always remember my uh, my daughter because we, we was explaining about um it, them taking the teeth out and opening the jar up and they said that they would be putting a metal plate and bethany just asked she says well mummy will 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 the metal plate be on the outside of his face you know so it's just obviously the way that she looked at yeah, it yeah 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 so, you know, she thought it were going to come out looking like Terminator. <laughs> I mean, once we did tell the children, I think they took it extremely well. Mm -hmm. As well, I think, I mean, children, they take things that you go into hospital, hospitals make you better and you come back out. They don't really think that there's actually times where you might not. Yeah. So they just took it for granted that everything was going to be fine and it was, it was coming home. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously... Gary and I felt very differently, mm -hmm. especially when we were told that uh, he may not make it off the table. Yeah. It was, you know, there was a very high chance of stroke. Mm -hmm. And with Gary and I, obviously, we weren't married at the time. We didn't want, my worst fear was that his mum and dad were going to come. They were going to take him away and I mm -hmm. wouldn't get a choice over anything. Mm -hmm. I knew that's not what Gary wanted. Yeah. I knew he'd want to stay in his home. So we decided that, you know, we need to get married. Yeah. So we uh, applied for an emergency license. Um, we had three weeks to plan mm -hmm. the, the wedding in total. We, it was a bit of a joke, really, because the way we got engaged was uh, it was Valentine's Day earlier that year. And uh, I was, uh, I was, out with some friends and my friends are saying, oh, ask Gary to marry you. I'm like, no, me won't say yeah. He won't, he won't say yeah. And they're like, oh, no, no, ask him, ask him. I'm like, no, he won't. So I just gave him my phone and said, here, you ask him. Well, eventually, with the <laughs> backwards and forwards text messages, eventually it were, oh, yeah, why not? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of thought, right, okay, five years engagement. Little did we know that, we wouldn't even get five months. Yeah. So yeah, went away, got married, and it was just an absolute whirlwind, really, from then in. Yeah. yeah. You know, the whole lead up was just constant worry. We knew that Gary had, uh, had just started a new job, so he'd not been there long enough that the time that he had off, he wouldn't yeah. be paid. Yeah. So who was going to pay the bills? My wages wouldn't cover <clears> it. Mm -hmm. I knew that I'd have to take time off to care for him. Yeah. So, you know, we, we were both off for a year. Mm -hmm. So all that worrying. And we tried a lot to get to prepare for certain things so that I could take control of the bills and, and this, that and the other. But we had no support, no help. Mm. And every time we rang the companies to say, look, this is what's going to happen. I need to take control of these bills. Oh, ring us when it's happened. Can't do anything until it's happened. Well, then when it has happened and Gary can't talk, he can't give them permission to speak to me. Yeah. yeah. So we were just in deadlock with, with the yeah. finance side of things. No yeah. help, no support, no nothing. So that, that was a worry to how we were mm -hmm. going to manage that way. So, yeah, it, it was a very difficult time, but the kids just took it so well. Yeah. And I don't ever remember a time where we had to actually stop and think and actually worry about the children and about how they were taking it. Because no. they just took it with a pinch of salt. It, well, I, they just got on with it. 
they cut yeah. probably better than we did. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess there's an element of it's tougher for kids. It's harder for kids to overthink it, which tends to be what we do. I think you know, as adults, we do all the millions of what ifs in that situation. And I guess you had a, an awful lot of what ifs to deal with. Mm-hmm. Definitely, you did have them, yeah. So, so it was a tough journey to the operation, um, but when you had it. Gary, things they went better than you were warned they might do. Like we said, you know, it, it's still tough and not great, but it, it, it went the worst things that they talked about happening didn't happen. Uh, you know, you were told that straight after the operation that you would need enteral feeding and medication for about six weeks through a, a nasogastric tube, uh, which I guess isn't great, but it has an end date. Is is that how it actually happened? Well, that's how it started to happen. Not as the, it never did happen that way. Yeah, I did see the end date of six weeks with this NG tube. And I would on feed 20 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And obviously trying to get my strength back. But the tube kept causing me problems and coughing. Uh, I can't swallow my own saliva. So when I'm in hospital, I'm panicking because I'm thinking I'm choking. And I had to have a suction machine. And it was just so nerve-wracking and so terrifying that throughout the night, all I could think about was I can't swallow, I can't breathe hardly because it's all pulling up in the back of my throat. Yeah. Trying to have the suction machine next to me on all the time so I can just put it in there to get it out. Couldn't sleep. And I, in my eyes, I couldn't see the six weeks getting me rid of this tube. Yeah. And I couldn't. And it didn't happen. I struggled with it. And yet, in the end, I had to remove it because yeah. it was coiling up. But that's another story which I might mention a bit later. Yeah, yeah. Funny, yeah. funny side to it as well. Now I can look okay. back. Okay. But I couldn't <laughs> at the time. No, no. One of the things you mentioned in your account um, of the recovery in hospital is that you used a whiteboard when you couldn't speak. Um, and that if you got cross, you would write bigger and in capitals to shout at the kids. Um, Colette, in your account, you mentioned Bethany thought that was funny, and at times so did you. Um, maybe it's not best to ask Gary how he responded when that happened, um, but I guess there were some moments of lightness in, in that period. But again, how was that initial period of recovery for you, seeing Gary immediately post up and then those those first few weeks? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, even though the doctors kind of said, you know, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, I was expecting to see worse in some ways. When I did go see him as soon as he came out of surgery, it was horrific. Mm. I don't think anything can prepare you for seeing that. Mm. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. And I remember sitting there by his bedside, just holding his hand and sobbing. Because you just think, how on earth can anybody come back from that? Mm-hmm. And so obviously I, I didn't stay all night. I wasn't allowed to. I had to go home. I'd got the children at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got home. The next day, Bethany's like, Adamant, I'm coming with you. Yeah. So it was like, right, okay. So I had to sit her down and explain to her what to expect and what she'd see. Mm-hmm. And when we got to the hospital, it was the difference was amazing. It was yeah. sat up, he was alert. Yes, he couldn't speak. He did look tired, and his scar was a, an absolute mess. Yeah. But nowhere near. I thought he would still be in the same state as what I'd seen him the night before. Yeah. Yeah. So I was quite surprised. And I think Bethany were like, well, what the heck are you going on about when we saw the Yeah. Yeah, exaggerated so, again. Yeah, 
But in the weeks to follow, I mean, Bethany was an absolute rock. She she came with me every single day. We wow. sat in that hospital for nearly 12 hours every day. And she never once moaned. She just took stuff with us. She taught me how to get on the train because I'd never done it before. Didn't have a clue how to read a train timetable, nothing. And to drive to Leeds, I wasn't confident. And the parking was horrific. It was yeah, £16 it a day. And we couldn't claim any of that back. And with only yeah. my wage coming in, we, we just wasn't an option. Yeah. So she taught me, she took me to the train station and we got on the train. And uh, she's like, come on, mom, we can do this. We can do this, you know. And then we'd walk up from Leeds train station and she knew exactly where she was going because she got a little Google thing on her phone. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, she just, she just came with me and she was pure brilliant. Yeah. And I think because she was there as well, even though you weren't seeing the progress like we wanted and as quick as we wanted to see it, you had to keep a brave face on. Mm -hmm. And the only thing really I think that got us through it, and I think Gary will agree with me, is just we had to laugh about everything. Didn't yeah. matter how bad it was, we made a joke out of it. Yeah. You know, I me and get Bethany, we used to open a bag of crisps, smoky bacon walkers crisps, Gary loved them. And we used to lay them open on his chest so that he could smell them and be going, we'd be like, oh, you can't have one, can you? Oh, never mind, I'll have them for you. You know, <laughs> and just, I know people will probably think that that's cruel, but it got us through because we'd all laugh, yeah. you know, and they would, they would, you know, Bethany used to take silly selfies with him, you know, with all his little filters on and things. And, you know, we just had to keep things lighthearted. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I mean, there were, there were times where, you know, Bethany wasn't around. She, you know, she'd have to go off because every morning Gary didn't want the nurses having anything to do with his yeah. care as such, yeah. that non-medical care. So yeah. every morning I used to have to go in early doors, help him shower, help him yeah. do everything that he needed to do, you know, yeah. make sure that he was all clean and everything else and, and Bethany had just gone sit and watch TV. But I mean, we used to have some jokes about that because I mean, I'm not exactly the tallest person in the world and Gary's huge compared to me. So me yeah, trying yeah. to hold him up to get him in a shower. <laughs> we had some funny times. Uh, so, did you pretty much have a shower as well? Well, it did kind of get that way until we got the hang of it. And yeah. then it was like, okay, got the shower thing. I'm like, come on, right, okay, turn around, next bit. <laughs> so... But yeah, we, we we eventually got the hang of it, didn't we? <laughs> we did, yeah. I remember yeah. the feeding tube just trying to hold it out to one side so the one game went through. And his, his, his scar at the beginning wasn't allowed to get wet either. So trying to have a shower, holding him up and not get that wet either. Mm. You know, it, 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 yeah, were, you, it were tricky, but we had fun. Yeah, you can't uh, really put a plastic bag on your head, can you? <laughs> not really. Although it it's could have like been it... something I would have tempted to try at some points. <laughs> 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 Every morning I'd get a phone call, you know, or well, a text message. Can you bring this? Can you bring that? I need this. I need that. When are you coming? It was like, I am at home trying to look after two children, trying to keep a house afloat and getting everything that you need going on a train, going all the way to Leeds every single day, as well as trying to do the washing and everything else. It's like, give me a break. I am doing the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> so there were times that like, it might have had a few choice words back saying, just wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. But on a yeah. whole, we did. We just laughed. Everything be just became a joke. Yeah. And I think yeah. other people on the ward used to look at us and think, how cruel is she? <laughs> No, no, the things see, that we that, just used to do. That, that's just been northern humour, isn't it? It's kind of, you know. Well, the, maybe the, it the is. The worse yeah. the situation <laughs> gets, the, the worse the jokes get and the worse things you laugh at. One of the things uh, that we talked about the other day when, when we sort of caught up and talked about how we would do this was the, the taking the photographs. Gary, you'd sort of said you really like to look forward at stuff and maybe sometimes you didn't appreciate how far you'd come because at that point in particular you really didn't want to look back tell us a little bit about you know the motivation of the of the photographs well on days which you know I still now get kind of down about certain things 
when I do look at these photographs and I see that the state I was in and how I was laid up, couldn't do anything, get up on feed to see now I'm now back working. Yeah. I'm getting up, I'm looking after myself. Just the progress is like, wow, I've come so far. <laughs> and then it lifts me again to yeah. you know, push on that bit more and yeah. let other people know that we do have dark times. I still have dark times. Yeah. But little steps, progress, and you know, you achieve what you yeah. set yourself to achieve. Mm. I think it's a, a really interesting approach to do that. And I, I don't know, have you, have, you, have you told that sort of um, that story to, to other people and they, they've taken you up, they've done it as well? Or, or um, you know, is no. it something that uh, people are, have, haven't tried? <laughs> I don't think people have tried in that sense. We might have mentioned it a couple of times, but yeah. it's more now I'm trying to get the point across as well. And yeah. let people know, you know, what you can achieve. Mm. And achieving things doesn't have to go to extreme of what I do. No. But just getting out of bed, putting your socks on, or that's achieving something. If you don't succeed yeah. everything, the tiny bit you have succeeded in, that's an achievement. Yeah. No matter how small it is. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit later about the stuff you've done. I mean, quite honestly, uh, when we get to that, I, th I think you're a nutter um, <laughs> because some of the stuff you do is just is just completely mad, but but also very admirable. Um, if we, if we go back a little bit, Colette, to the time when it was you were getting ready for Gary to be discharged. You'd already be going, going to the hospital to do a lot of the care for him, like like you said, and help the recovery. Um, but how were you prepared for his discharge by the hospital team? And how did you prepare your home and your family for that? Well, the hospital um, obviously gave us full training on how to use his pump before yeah. we were allowed to go home. Um, unfortunately, the pump that they trained us on was a Leeds pump. And... <laughs> They didn't really take into consideration that we didn't live in Leeds and that when we got home, we wouldn't be having that pump. Yeah. So we were trained on a pump that we wouldn't be keeping. Yeah. So it was um, when we found out that it was like, well, we're going to be then stuck at home with no, no support trying to train on a new pump. Yeah. So that didn't quite go according to plan. No. As for being at home, it's, Gary probably will shout at me for saying this, but it's like a nervous excitement, like yeah. you do feel when you're bringing a newborn baby home. Yeah. And I just went into nesting mode, preparing the house, making sure that he's got his bed sorted out, clearing space for all his things to go and making sure I'd know where everything was so that, you know, I could just get to things when I needed them. You know, and hoped that that would put Gary's mind at ease as well, knowing that he, mm. you know, where things were and that we weren't going to be fumbling around like idiots. We were organised, we were prepared. And uh, so, yeah, we've got all his medical stuff sorted out. He had a medical station downstairs where all his medication was all set out. We'd got very clear instructions written and charts that I'd made up that we could tick when he'd had each bit of medication and when we knew the, when yeah. the next one was coming. So I suppose it, it, it were like a baby, like getting into that routine. Yeah, yeah. So I was all right. The only thing I think that I would have liked was maybe a little bit more preparation from the nurses, maybe, maybe just talking to me, not necessarily Gary, to tell me what kind of things to expect and what, patients may feel and what yeah. reaction they may have when they come out yeah yeah because yeah. i don't feel i was fully prepared emotionally physically yes yeah. yeah and i think i didn't have as much worry as gary did in the pump side of things because um at the time my job is uh, well, well was working um with special needs children and yeah. i was familiar with the pumps so yeah. I was already trained through work. Yeah. So that took some pressure off me 
And I was quite happy then knowing that the new pump that we'd get in Halifax was the pump I was trained on. Yeah. So that took pressure away. Yeah. So it was, I think, easier, more easier for me with the technology side of things than it was for Gary. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, having worked in Entral Nutrition, um, we used to see that quite a lot around the country where if you went into a big tertiary centre you, and you were discharged back, that you, it wasn't the same pump. And I think some of the hospitals are trying to um, smooth that out a bit now, but certainly it's not the first time I've, I've heard that tale told, um, you know, and it's, um, it's about getting in quickly and getting some training, but it doesn't always happen. And I suppose that's sort of a top tip for, healthcare professionals just think about what equipment the patients and family are actually going to deal with rather than what you deal with and I think um, as well maybe a problem sheet to what problems you could possibly have with the nasal tube yeah. because we we were shown how to get an aspirate from you know from the tube every morning while I was in the hospital mm. but nobody told us what to do if we couldn't get one <laughs> No, so, no. where little, uh, just little tips like that would have made a massive difference when we got when he, you know, when he eventually came home. Uh, looking at it, I know it might sound a bit bad, but because I wasn't a cancer patient, then doors shut on me, but I was in a position where I was worse off than some head and neck cancer patients. Yeah, but I couldn't receive any funding. Yeah. So we need to kind of look at some funding along that way. Well, we went, we we eventually claimed PIP, the independent payments, but that soon stopped as soon as he could put his socks on. Yeah, yeah. Because his cost has been able to look after himself. Yeah, yeah. So we had no financial support whatsoever. They say we got into £17,000 worth of arrears on our mortgage. And we're still now having to find that money each month to, to pay that money yeah. off. Yeah. And this, there was absolutely no support. We couldn't even get a blue badge so that he could park closer to his appointments because he could barely walk. He couldn't even walk to the oh. end of the street. Yeah. It was because all because we didn't have the cancer label. Yeah. So it's, it's like there were you no counselling it, available. It, it, you, you've got to be able to tick a very specific box, haven't you, to get certain things. And Gary doesn't fit in any box <laughs> at all. No, no. Even with this COVID, the, the forms that they send out, you know, uh, do you suffer from this, this, this and this? Well, actually, no. But yeah, he is clinically highly vulnerable. But yeah, he yeah. doesn't fit in any of those boxes. Yeah, yeah. So we've just found that all along that we're just battling yeah. with everything that really, I mean, we can't even get a free prescription. No. Gary has to pay for all his medication, but yet without his medication and his food, he wouldn't survive. But yet someone who's got an overactive thyroid can have a free prescription and we yeah. have to pay for his. Yeah. And it is, it's not fair. No. I'm sure no, I'm no. not the only person out there that's... I'm sure you're not, situation. but I think that really, really, the financial burden really um, slowed Gary's recovery down. Because yeah. of the worry. Gary had yeah. to go back to work earlier than really should have done. Yeah. Because we couldn't afford. They were taking the house. He had to yeah. go back to work. Yeah. And it, it yeah. just, yeah. you know. We're, we're now moved on, haven't we? We're, we're we have, forward, but I think at the know. time, it, it made it made you very, very angry, didn't it? Oh, yeah. You were really, it really bitter out. about it all. And, yeah. and it, it did. It did. It was such a worry. Yeah. And then, as I say, all the bill companies, we couldn't speak to any of them because they wouldn't take me talking to them, but yet they couldn't hear Gary. Oh, no. put it in writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, we need exactly. it now. I had yeah, more operations, yeah, yeah. didn't I? Because we left well, you did, yeah, because paralyzed. Gary's vocal cords were paralysed. Uh-huh. So he had to have uh, filler put in so that he could eventually speak. And then he yeah. had loads of therapy, speech therapy, and things like that, just to get his voice as good as it is now. So, and there's still this stuff you can't pronounce, isn't there? We take my cat at you all the time because oh, yeah, certain I things can't. you can't say. 
quite a few because my tongue's paralysed. Like you should have told me that in advance. I could have worked that in. <laughs> you don't you think thing. of these things, do you? I could have told you a list of words you can't say. I know. It's, <laughs> it, it's, pro it's probably against my professional code of conduct mm -hmm. or something, but, you know, I'd have still done it. I had uh, some Botox for, in my saliva glands to try and dry them up. All right. I can't believe people pay for Botox because he killed. I'd never go back again. Yeah, maybe they used a bit more on your vocal, uh, you know, on your salivary glands than, mind you, having said, seen some some people's faces that don't move yeah. at all. I don't think, you know, they seem to have plenty of it, don't they? They do, yeah. They wouldn't put anywhere where I needed it. No. no. So, um, Gary, C Colette's talked about her nervous excitement and uh, nesting approach to uh, getting ready for discharge. Um how did the preparation go for you? Um, you know, did, did you feel involved in it or did you feel like it, for you it felt more like the focus was on Colette because she was, you know, going to be sorting stuff out for you? How, how did that bit go? Well, to be honest, uh, I was that tired all the time. I just kind yeah. of left it to them to discuss between, you know, Colette and nurses to prep everything. I tried to keep an eye on what I needed to do, but my energy levels at that time, I didn't have them. And mm. I just couldn't concentrate. So I did leave it all down to Colette. And I, that sounds like a really interesting observation because Colette said she felt like people should have talked to her more and you think that they did, but there was obviously a bit, bit of a disjoint there. So, you know, maybe that's another top tip is... Just make sure that um, everybody feels comfortable um, with going home. And and uh, Gary, the, the, when you actually got home, how was that period? Was that straightforward? When I eventually got home, <laughs> that was the most nerve-wracking part for me. And I felt outside in like a comfort zone. You know, I was scared, petrified. I'd left hospital, which is, to me, one of a safe zone. You know, I had mm -hmm. nurses there knowing what they were doing. Not trying to say I didn't know what to do at the time, but just my own, you know, sake, I was petrified. I couldn't settle. You were nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. What happens if something happens and we can't fix it? What do we do? Mm -hmm. Halifax, Huddersfield, won't deal with me. I had to go all the way back to Leeds. And mm. I just couldn't sell. It was too, I was petrified, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just didn't want to come home, yeah. to be fair. But yeah. I know Colette had been prepared and everything. Kids would like to see me at home. So I tried to put on a brave face to get home, but I was terrified and scared inside. Yeah. And I just yeah. kind of smiled and went along with it until I got home and then I wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. And that's all mm -hmm. I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. I know it upset Colette, and it wasn't anything that Colette had done. It's just that I didn't feel safe. I wanted yeah. to just get back. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, Colette, Gary's talked about how he felt scared out of hospital. And it's probably not an easy thing to talk about, but... If you can, you know, you've done so much <clears throat> preparation and learned so much to be ready for his discharge. How, how did it feel for you that he felt unsafe and how did you work through that? I think the first the first night when Gary first came home, to see him so frightened, you know, a grown man so frightened to the point where we had to get the doctor out that night to medicate him, to calm him down because he just yeah. was so uncontrollable. It was crying, it was shaking. It was just in sheer panic. Mm. And things did get easier through, throughout, you know, throughout the, the coming days after that. But I think it was the knowing that you, if something goes wrong, we can't just go to Halifax. You can't no. just call an ambulance and get them to take you no. to Halifax because they, they weren't equipped to deal with him. Yeah. You know, and 
I think as well when he when he was feeling like that, I just felt completely helpless. Yeah, completely helpless. But then you also go through lots of emotions that you feel guilty that you shouldn't be having those feelings. Yeah, because it's like it's not happening to me. It's happening to Gary. He has every mm. right to feel the way he feels. I mm. didn't have a right to have any <clears throat> of those feelings. Yeah. So I felt guilty an awful lot that, you know, I, I'm upset. It's not what I want. I don't want him to go back to hospital. I want him to stay here with me. I'm more than capable of looking after him. And it was completely just out of my control. And yeah. I had to just get through it by keep telling myself and just talking to myself and saying, look, it's not about you. It's about Gary and it's about how Gary feels. And mm -hmm. whether you feel that that is justified, how he's feeling, is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You know, he feels that way and you can't tell him that that's wrong because it's not. Yeah. So it's just a case of stay strong, try and help him through it. Yeah, yeah. And then on the times when he wasn't around, then that was my time to just have my meltdowns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you said, you know, get him through it. You did get through it. Um, after the, the initial difficulties you described, th things progressed really well. And, um, and and Gary, you started feeling like your, your pre-op self. And um, because you've always been active in sport, you wanted to get back to it. But that's that's a really big step even just to start that. So, so how did you start off getting back into doing some sport? My journey really started uh, when I was seeing Macmillan nurses. And I was seeing them, yes, I didn't have cancer, but they didn't know where to put me. So Macmillan yeah. kind of took me under their umbrella. Yeah. And they just set up uh, a pilot scheme for head and neck cancer patients. And of course it was to do with, you know, getting back to fitness as well as eating for some people, which obviously we can. It was a case of, would you like to try and see? There's only four other people in the group at mm -hmm. the time. So I went, well, yes, I'll try anything, you know. And that's where my journey started. I went to the first meeting and seen the other head and neck cancer patients who have gone through similar things and are on tube and now exercising slightly, I thought I can join in with them. The very first time it was, I couldn't hardly do anything. I got home and I think I fell asleep straight away. I mean, my glasses slanted and I'm just laid on settee just out of it. And Claire took a picture of me and posted it. I thought, oh, that was nice of you. <laughs> I can see the funny side of it if you ever see it. Yeah. But then every week I went back and I got stronger. And meeting other people and talking to them, it was the talking part that really helped. And I thought, I can now start to build bit by bit and get back into my uh, fitness. Yeah, so yeah. That's where it all really started from. So cool. thank you, Macmillan, for putting me into that pilot group. Yeah, yeah. I have to say... Um... Um, Macmillan looked after my dad, and I, I think they're an awesome organisation. I, re I really do. Uh, some of the stuff they do is is absolutely fabulous. And um, before we we talk more about the sports, and we have got a chunk to talk about with the sports. Um, one of the things um, missing from Gary's account that is in yours relates to you know another part of the recovery, starting to go out and do things that most people take for granted such as as going to restaurants uh, you know it, can you can you tell us a little about what that was like and perhaps maybe it is still a bit like that it's still like having a baby but double the amount of things that you've got to take with you <laughs> so it's not you can't do anything spontaneous everything has to be planned um we've got to make sure that we've got our emergency kits with us so that if his button comes out or anything like that where we've got everything we need to be equipped because we have all all the way to Leeds to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was one time when Gary um, ended up in Halifax Hospital and uh, we were in A&E and 
we'd been sat in the waiting room for hours and hours and hours to the point where Gary was getting dehydrated and we'd not got anything with us. We just assumed mm. you go to a hospital, they're going to have things. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I went to the nurses and I said, look, you know, he's tube fed. He's, uh, he's, he's needing his medication and we've not got anything with us. You know, can you give him something? Oh, we don't have anybody trained here. Nobody in a and is trained to do tube feed. We don't get that many people coming in, so we don't get the training. They were like, oh, lovely. <laughs> so they went around yeah. the whole hospital, all the wards, trying to find extensions and giving sets to try and get some form of fluids into him. Mm-hmm. And they found nothing. Yeah. So I had to leave Gary at the hospital, go home, get all the things that we needed and take them back to the hospital to be able to just put some fluids in him, just for a drink. Wow. Wow. Because there was just, there was nothing. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously the, the district nurses around here, they're not equipped. They don't know. They don't know how to use any of the equipment that we use. No, 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 no. We, uh, when Gary first came out of the hospital, he was on a suction tube in the hospital. Yeah. And they knew he couldn't swallow his own saliva but never sent us home with the suction tube. So for days, we had to fight and fight and fight to get a suction tube. And I remember the district nurse coming to the front door and just went, here, you've got one. I don't know how to use it, here. And she walked off. And they were like, oh, okay. (laughs) So I look enough with where I worked, I'd got a nurse at the school I worked in and she only lived down the road, and I know she'd given me suction training before. Yeah, so yeah. it was straight on the phone, can you come? So she yeah. came, and she she was the one that trained us up. Yeah. So yeah. it's exciting to go out. When you need all that kind of equipment, it's quite scary. Yeah, yeah. So I think we started just maybe going to family first. Yeah. Knowing that, you know, we weren't in too far away and that, you know, we didn't have to stay along if we didn't need to. And then we started then just going out to other places, but that were again close to home. But we knew well, so we knew what facilities they'd got. We knew that yeah. everything that we needed would be accessible. Yeah. And then over time, we we have ventured further. We've never got on holiday yet. No. It's still something we'd like to do, but the thought of going abroad at the moment, well, in current climate, we can't, but in yeah, even, even in normal circumstances... <laughs> the thought of going abroad with all the equipment that's needed yeah it's it's a scary prospect Mm. so i Mm. mean just simple we went to a um we took our niece to um i think it was yorkshire wildlife park and gary had been in charge of packing his own bag but not bothered to pack in a giving set it was an an extension he didn't have I, i felt a dig coming on there gary yeah I can feel it. <laughs> so all day in the heat, I mean, it was a hot summer. All day, Gary had gone with no fluids, no medication, no nothing, because we hadn't got a giving set. <laughs> so, and then I looked in his emergency kit in his car and it had a syringe in it and that was it. It's like, really? <laughs> so now we do. We do make sure that both those cars are equipped with emergency kits. We've got extra yeah, giving good stuff, idea. extra buttons, extra everything. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and we do kind of have a bit of a tick list. It's like, have you got this? Have you got this? Have you got this? Are you sure you've got this? Right, we're good to go. And you'll guarantee yeah. there'll be some... Normally, his toilet roll is not with him, and we'll have to go stop at a shop and buy a pack of four. <laughs> oh, yeah. On <laughs> route. The toilet roll it is kind of a, it's a legend in its own lunchtime, isn't it? <laughs> Tell us about the toilet. Look, he's got it there. Yeah, always with me. <laughs> well, because Gary can't swallow his own saliva, he has to get rid yeah. of it into a, into a tissue. And we was on a um, a pint uh, Christmas quiz. No, no, it wasn't a Christmas quiz. It was just a normal quiz. And Gary was doing his uh, cycling challenge at the time. So he was in the garage with his toilet roll and I was doing the quiz on the, on the Zoom meeting and I got a text message from Gary saying, I've dropped my toilet roll. And of course, he couldn't get off his bike. He needed to keep going. Yeah. So 
to us it's normal. So to come out yeah. with a statement like, oh, hang on a minute, I've got to go. Gary's lost his toilet roll. He's dropped it. And I just went. Yeah. And, so, and then by the time I come back, everybody was in absolute hysterics thinking that he'd been stuck on the toilet or something and that he'd run out of toilet roll and I just broadcasted it. <laughs> yeah. Once again, you find out who your friends are, Gary. You do, yeah. Ended up marrying this one. <laughs> so... um. We talked, uh, just before we go on, you mentioned the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. I just want to say a plug, because if anybody hasn't been to the Yorkshire Wildlife Park who's listening to this, it is a fabulous day out when it's open. <laughs> it is open, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, been me, open for lights. Yeah, my sister-in-law works there, so, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, give, give them a bit it's, of a plug. It's a great place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, as you mentioned so before as well about going to restaurants. Yeah, yeah. What I tended to used to do was when I rang and booked a table, I felt yeah. I had to explain why only one of us would be ordering. Yeah. So I would do that usually on booking so that we didn't yeah. get any questions when we got there. Yeah. But then there were other times when we just went, you know, just to a bar. Yeah. And it's, it's a man's job to go to the bar and order I drinks know. for him and his wife. So Gary yeah, would yeah. always go to the bar and he'd just order a drink for me and then they'd be looking at him as he said well aren't you going to order some it so again you feel like you've got to explain but then when I'm explaining I can feel Gary getting embarrassed so we just don't go now yeah and if we do yeah. go to a restaurant now it's usually for like family birthdays where this the whole family's there so there's a big yeah. group of us and Gary then can hide away in a corner and he's not seen as much yeah, where yeah. it stood out more if it was just the two of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, we just again, we yeah. go to other places, we find other things to do now, things that don't mm. that food's not the for, the focus of. So we go bowling, we go to the cinema, we go to laser quest, we go yeah. crazy golfing, where we can grab something to eat whilst we're there, but the main activity is not food. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess um, you know, a lot of things are. You know, birthdays are about food and parties, aren't they? And Christmas is about food and parties. Yeah. It is, you know, do you do do you do those things differently? We have to, yes. Christmas, yeah. This uh, the first year that Gary came out, we'd got my mum coming for Christmas Day. So, and obviously with having the children, you've still got to make it special. Yeah. So, in order to get Gary involved, I bought him a wooden Christmas dinner. So he had a full Christmas dinner, all made of wood, with his little gravy boat. He had a cheese board for afterwards, a chocolate log as well. And he sat and had Christmas dinner with us, but he had a wooden. <laughs> and that comes out every year now. I still have my cups of oh, and coffee. he's got his little cup of yeah. coffee. <laughs> Ga Gary, I'm disappointed. You had the opportunity there when Kellogg was talking about the wooden Christmas dinner to say it looked and tasted just like the one she cooked the year before, and you missed that. I just didn't remember miss that next one. time she t next time she tells that story, you need to get in there with that. Thanks, <laughs> I remember that now. I'll just make a note. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we said we would come back to the exercise piece, um, and um, the um, it, you both mention it in in your stories. Um, but you talk about it differently. Uh, Colette says Gary came with her uh, to the running club. Gary, yours, Gary says, my and this is a quote: "My wife dragged me." So which was it? It was my quote. She dragged me. Yeah. yeah. Little. <laughs> she, she were going to the running club. And I'm thinking, well, that's good. But she's kept on going and going and going. It's like, I don't feel like I want to go yet. You know, going outside, having my pump going in a backpack. But yeah, she did drag me in and so. Great it was pump. more, my work colleagues were all going. So we, it was a yeah. social event that we yeah. went. And then my friends all ditched me. And I had nobody to go with. So it's like, come uh -huh. on, you come in with me because I don't. So you made him own. go. 
So, so, yeah. so actually, your fr your friend's ditching you has led to all sorts of uh, yeah, um, it's their fault. Feats, yeah, feats of athletic uh, ridiculousness, quite honestly, Gary. Um, so, um, I guess from that initial start at, at the running club, um, you've progressed. I'm just going to rattle off a list here and feel free to um, to add some. You completed the London Marathon. The first time a tube-fed person had ever done it, you ran the three peaks. That 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 is extreme. Uh, you've done the Great North Run. You've done the Yorkshire Marathon, and you did the London Marathon again, but in the, under four hours. Have, have I missed anything? Obviously, I've the Melbourne Cycling Challenge. Ah, yeah, yeah. Which was so? What was the cycling 75, challenge? Three hundred seventy-five miles in five and a half days. Wow. So we're going from, originally I should have done it, obviously, on the road, but with COVID, uh, I had to do it in garage. Yeah, yeah. He's going from, like, Christchurch up to Durham, where yeah. Ham Week was going to be held that year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did have a few uh, sore parts during yeah, the yeah. training and during the uh, event. Yeah, and I, I've watched I've watched the videos of... Um, yeah, you you doing it, and then Colette sort of taking over as the sports commentator. Uh, you know, where you're pointing at the map and everything. Uh, you've de there's definitely an alternative career for you there, Colette. Um, no. <laughs> so so you know, I guess what people will see is you know here's a list of things Gary's done. It's amazing, and they are fantastic achievements. But what does it take? from a logistics and nutritional intake adjustment perspective to be able to do those things? Because it can't be that straightforward. No, it's not straightforward. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. I just, I don't get up and go, right, I'm doing this challenge and off I go. Yeah. As we said before, there's planning. And these challenges do take a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. I've got to speak to the dietitian, Lisa, I speak to nutrition nurse, Martin. I explain to them exactly what I want to try and achieve. Obviously, they turn around and say I'm a nutter. But yeah, yeah, they're right. Yeah, I agree with them. But then, yeah. say, we'll take the three peaks, for example, because that's quite close to where we live. Yeah. Uh, we've gone up uh, and gone over the three peaks but done each peak one day at a time so to speak yeah, yeah. so not just on his own uh, yeah. when I was at that pilot scheme for Milan I met someone called Jeff he's a keen walker so mm -hmm. with his group of people he took us up and over the three peaks and I could go back to the dietitian and say right I felt like this on the first peak, you stay. Yeah. What do you think I need to do? You know, lack of energy, lack of, you know, get up and go. Yeah. So she explains you need more calories, how to take them in, try this. If that doesn't work, maybe have your pump going at a slower or faster rate. So yeah. you have to go back and try it again, just yeah. walking. Yeah. So, Speak to uh, my team, explain to her that, you know, if I get a problem with button, she'll explain, you know, what things to look after, take care of yeah. it. Then after doing the three peaks, it's then, right, I need X, Y, and Z to try and get me through it. Yeah. Like support vehicles, uh, backpacks, um, yeah. set up, ready. I had, I think it was three backpacks when I did London Marathon, which yeah. I had to swap around as I was doing it. But yeah. On three peaks, I just went, right, I'm going. And I went. But yeah. I'd spent months in training. It wasn't yeah. an overnight. So no. you don't try it at home. Time yeah. yeah. You've got to speak to your dietitian and let them know exactly how you feel so they can... Yeah tell you what nutrition you need. And I think you said, actually, um, 
at some point your dietitian and your nutritionist actually went running with you. Yes, uh, when I first got going with running club, I was trying to explain to them the issues I'm having when I'm running, because obviously the fluid's bouncing up and down. Yeah. The, pump, the pump's stopping because it's getting air into it. Yeah. So they were a bit confused. So they volunteered to come out and go running with me. Yeah. And from that, they picked up a load of good knowledge of what yeah, yeah. what you can and can't do. Yeah. And from that, we've learned how to manage my pump when I'm running and how to secure it in better. Yeah. And get all the fluids in so I can do my challenges. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, that's fantastic to hear because obviously there was a few times where you had not such a an amazing uh, uh, experience with some of the healthcare professionals, but you've clearly got two absolute cracking ones there now uh, supporting you in the, the sports piece. Yeah, uh, on a nutrition and uh, Martin, the nurse from the nutrition and obviously Lisa, dietitian, but I've also got the support of my family. Because I can't do these challenges without their support as well. No, so that's no. crucial. Yeah, and 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 just just um, Colette, uh, you know, just jumping back a little bit. When Gary said he was going to do the first London Marathon, um, what 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 did you think when he said it? Well, to be honest with you, because Gary was always a runner anyway. Yeah. He'd applied for the London Marathon quite a few times before he got polar, but never actually yeah. got in. And then as his strength grew and grew and grew, and he was being able to run further and further, especially with when he was going out with the snails, it put my mind at ease knowing that he had other people with him, that, yeah. you know, that if anything did happen, he wasn't going to be on his own. Because there is times where he's set off and he's gone for a run and he doesn't tell me where he's going, doesn't tell me what route he's going. And two hours later, still no Gary. Three hours later, still no Gary. Four hours later, and he's come back and he says, I've done about 50 miles. And he's not taken any extra supplies with him. He's just gone. And it's like, really? You should know that you're not to do that. But yeah. the more, as I say, the more he built up, and he applied then for the London Marathon again. And I thought, you know, he can do it. Yeah. And he was gutted when he didn't get in yet again. Yeah. And then the head of the snails, um, they because they're a, a, a running club, they automatically get one place. Yeah. And the committee had, uh, had voted that they were giving it to Gary. Fantastic. So you so got yeah, the chance. He, he did. And I think... Once they actually told him that he'd got in, I think even then he thought, oh, God, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think the more and more as well, we planned on how it was going to be done and we looked at the route and how we could swap bags over. The logistics of doing it all, it was like, I don't have any doubt that Gary can run it. Mm -hmm. It's whether we can get all these bits in place yeah. to enable him to do it yeah because yeah. we we contacted obviously yeah the london marathon and they can't make any special provisions for you no so it was a case of i had to be at a certain point at a certain time waiting for him well the crowds yeah, yeah. down on the london marathon they're like four or five people deep yeah. and trying to get to the front to be able to pass equipment over people just don't want to move you know, you, you say to them, look, I've got somebody coming. I need to get this equipment to them. Oh, well, why are you so special? I've got somebody coming as well. My niece is coming down. And we just found that people were so rude and nobody would help us. So we, we just ended up having to get the elbows out. And it yeah, was yeah. like, we are coming in. <laughs> and then going no. on the London Underground with backpacks that are whirring and making noises. We didn't have to get some funny looks. Yeah, and yeah. one lady tapped me on the shoulder and she says, love, your rucksack's leaking. He'd only left the pump switched on when he'd swapped it over at one of the points. And I'd gone on the underground, I'd got sticky electrolytes down my back. And, oh, 
wearing backpacks. But the second time was, was easier because we'd already got the plan in, plan in place and it worked. Yeah, yeah. But we did, yeah. um, we went on a trial and we thought we could do it like a relay that I kind of like run a little bit and pass the syringes to him like you do a baton. Yeah, so yeah. we tried it on the uh, the Bradford Half Marathon every time because it was a loop so I could stand in the same place and pass the baton every time he came yeah, around. Yeah. We dropped it every time. <laughs> we just could not master it at all. It's like, right, that's not going to work. We need to find yeah. something else. So yeah. we we did. We just trial and errored everything yeah. until we hit something that worked. Yeah. And that's what we do with all these challenges. We have to think completely outside the box. But so, no, so, no doubt at all that he could do it. I yeah. just hoped so, it would stop after he'd done it. I, I was, was going to say, did but, you think did you think he'd do the London Marathon, get it out of his system, then just go back to general running about the place? I kind of thought he would continue. If he could get into the London Marathon every year, he would do it. Yeah. But I thought that's what it would just stay at, just the London Marathon. But then he's yeah. been, since then, he's talking about doing the whole top six marathons. And it's like the logistics of going to another country to do it when we've not even had a holiday yet. Yeah. That is just <clears throat> mind blowing. So, how we do that and the, and the cost implications of getting the whole support team out there. So, sometimes Gary comes up with these challenges, but doesn't necessarily think of the logistics behind it. And then we all have to kind of rally around and say, right, okay, he wants to do this. How are we going to make it happen? So um, you, you mentioned the six, um, the six big marathons. Is that is that the next thing, or is with with sort of COVID interrupting us? Is that is there a step before that? I've had to put the uh, the six marathons to back burner at the moment. So I am looking at other events at this moment in time. Uh, and I'm going to push myself even further. But uh, I'll have to come back on and announce it once I've yeah. uh, put it out there, exactly what the challenge is going to be. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a big one. So okay. kind of watch, watch this space. We will gladly have you back for your announcement. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we might even come and help you film it and stuff, you know, because Cameron and I do like to do a bit of camera work. Um just, just to kind of um, finish up, we said at the beginning, uh, you know, we're doing this podcast to coincide with the start of uh, Pints Let's Talk About Han campaign. Can you tell us what um, Pint has given you and, and means to you since you first got in touch with them and, and how it's helped? Because obviously you do an awful lot with Pint. So, so what has it given you, um, you know, during during your your journey with with enteral feeding? Well, Pine's given me, basically, a new family. It's opened up a network of people that you can kind of call aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters. They're all going through similar things and you can ring them up, so to speak, yeah. talk to them and just express how you feel and how you can get through each day. So... Being part of this group is now just extending the family even wider mm -hmm. and the support's there. And yeah. it's so lovely of the people that are on the group and advice. It's all there for you. So to yeah, me, yeah. it's just one big happy family. Yeah, yeah. And and, and from a from the point of view of a family member uh, with Pike Collette, how how has how has pint helped you? I think um, you always know that even if you can't ring somebody, there's the Facebook page. You can yeah. put something on that, and they're very quick to respond. So you don't feel like you're on your own. Um, the website has got so much information. You can mm -hmm. send for booklets or download booklets on every type of thing you could possibly want to know. Yeah, and. Uh, when we um, started going to their annual events, seeing people face to face that you've that you've spoke to online, that kind of made things. It was nice to put faces to the names. Yeah, yeah. And then um, when obviously we was asked to get involved, I mean that was just an honour, really, because I think by doing what Gary does and by 
you know, us coming on and to places like this and and talking about our experience, we we follow on from what Pint do and yeah, yeah. We, we help, you know, people and we let them know that sometimes, you know, what they're feeling and things like that. It's normal. You, it's okay to feel the way you feel. It is absolutely normal. Everybody goes through it and we're all here to support. And if you need anything and you feel that, you know, that you just want to just have a chat with any of us, we're there. Yeah. And, you know, to be ambassadors, it's just an honour. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job. Uh, and I have to say, you know, um, I'd say I'd say we're coming at the end of the time. We way overrun the time. Uh, but it's been... <laughs> It's been fantastic talking to you. Um, you know, thank you again for coming on. Uh, I think you are both awesome. And, um, you know, um, Gary, you for putting up with Colette. It's kind of, you know. It's the other way fantastic. around. <laughs> you can send me uh, a new medal for that. I'm really yeah, shorten, then. maybe we will. Um, but listen, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your story with us. And, um you know, I look forward to uh, to actually meeting you, uh, maybe later in the year or maybe next year at at an event when we're when we're all allowed out again. So, thank you, thank you for coming on. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Thank, thank you, you for, for having, having us. us. We'd like to make really clear is that unless explicitly stated, the views expressed in the NG podcast are those of the individuals and not those of NG Pod Global or of the organisations for whom the participants work. We hope you enjoy the NG podcast and if you do, please subscribe or like or both on whichever platform you're viewing or listening to it on.